you. Do you? Hint, it turns Bradford blue. So those samples right in the middle there, that is our purified protein right straight off of the nickel column. And so basically we're purifying malathehydrogenase, this really cool metabolic enzyme, and we're purifying it. Basically we did recombinant expression, so we stuck the gene for making bacillus offensis, so this bacterial malathehydrogenase, into a different type of bacteria, and we stuck it into these E. coli cells that are really good at expressing protein. And we stuck the version of it that had a little extra on the end, a histidine tag, a his tag. This allows us to then bind it to a nickel affinity resin. So resin is just a word for little beads. And basically we have this column that's filled with this nickel coated resin. Now our protein has a histidine tag that's gonna bind to that resin or it bound to that resin. So if we take the protein and we blow it through, then the protein sticks, other stuff flows off, we wash things off, and we get our pure protein. Voila! But our protein is first stuck inside of those bacterial cells. So the first thing that we had to do was we had to lyse the cells. And so basically break those cells open. And we did this with a couple different ways. Basically we added some enzymes. We had lysozyme, which helps us break down the cell wall. We had some benzenase, which is a nuclease that helps us like chew up the DNA and RNA because well, we care about the proteins. And well, we care about those proteins so much that we don't want to add a protease. We want to inhibit proteases. So we add nucleases, which chew up the DNA and RNAs and a protease and inhibitor that is going to protect our protein. Turns out protease inhibitor is like insanely expensive. So we only added the good stuff for like the lysis step and then we added a cheaper thing, PMSF for the later steps, which PMSF is a pain, but it'll um, inhibit most proteases or is at least serine proteases, not other kinds of proteases, which is why we want that like broader range one for the beginning lysis. But Speaking of that, so we did the enzymatic stuff, and what we also did then is we stuck it in a sonicator. And so you have this probe, and basically it sets out these ultrasonic waves. And so it's like how you clean your jewelry um, with those like ultrasonic cleaners, except this is like more powerful, and it's like Aah! scary. It's not really scary. But anyway, it has this probe, and it goes in your liquid, and then it sets off these waves. And you set it to go in like different intervals of waves. And what happens is it sets out these ultrasonic waves. The, as the waves travel through the liquid, you're gonna get these areas of high pressure and these areas of low pressure. The areas of low pressure, it's easier for things to vaporize. So in those areas of low pressure, the, the air bubbles are gonna form and they go, Whoa! and then the high pressure, bam! And then what happens is those air bubbles burst. When those air bubbles burst, they send out these little shock waves. It's this process called gaseous cavitation, and I have much more about it in other posts if you're interested. But that's going to help with the fire, help with the breaking up, and help with shearing the DNA. In addition to the nucleases, we really, really care about shearing up the DNA because you have a lot of genomic DNA. It just gets all gloopy and gloppy, and it pulls your protein down, and it causes all these issues, and it's all viscous and nasty. But after all of that, now you have this kind, you have this solution that is broken open cells, but we want to isolate the kind of like the liquid, the soluble stuff from the membrane gunk and all that bits. Hopefully our protein isn't in there. If it's in that membrane gunky stuff, it's likely because it's our protein was like insoluble and it formed these things called like ag um, inclusion bodies, which are just like these aggregates. And then those will pellet out with the membrane fraction, which you can figure out if you run an SDS page gel, you run your lysate, you run the soluble stuff, you run the membrane portion. If it's in that membrane portion, oh man, there's, there's a variety of strategies that you can do. So check out other posts for that. But anyway, so you spin things down in the ultra centrifuge, that really fast centrifuge, which the rotor gave me a new stain on my coat today. I know, beautiful, to match my dye. That's not the Bradford though, that's a different dye. Anyway, it's not hazardous, don't worry. So you get this pellet, and that's kind of the membrane gunk, and then we had liquid all above it, that was the cytosolic, and um, the liquid stuff that was inside of the cell, including, hopefully, our protein. And so then what we did is we took that solution and we put it on the column. We put it on the column and then we kind of did a bunch of washes. 
we did a variety of washes. We started with just washing with the same buffer that the solution that the protein was in, which had a low concentration of imidazole. Now, imidazole is a mimic of histidine, and so basically, it's like the amino acid histidine, or like our hist tag. Imidazole is just like the side chain portion of that, the part of histidine that makes it histidine rather than another amino acid. Imidazole is going to be able to compete our protein off the column if we have a lot of it, which is what we'll do later. But initially, we just want a low amount of it so that it's not going to um, let anything just like bind non-specifically to the resin, to those little beads. So then we're going to do some washes with that. That's going to wash most of the stuff off that's not binding. There's some stuff that's going to weakly bind to the resin because, well, proteins have histidines. Most proteins don't have that many. And well, most proteins definitely don't have like eight histidines in a row, which is what we have on the end of our protein in the form of the his tag. So our protein gets the advantage. It's gonna be able to bind that resin really tight, whereas that other stuff is kind of just gonna get washed off pretty easily, especially when we start amping up the imidazole. We have a gradient of imidazole, where basically we mix portions, um, rather than doing it in an active though, because we're doing a gravity flow, we basically had 10 mil portions and we would do like one to nine of um, wash buffer, elution buffer, so basically low, low imidazole, high imidazole, we mix the two and we do this in different steps. And so we would gradually increase the imidazole concentration, collecting them as different fractions each time. So basically we had it come out into the centrifuge tubes and then we collected these different fractions. And then we had to figure out, well, which fraction is our sample in? And so that's where the Bradford comes in. We started with the cheap, cheap cheating way. We basically just did a PCR strip and we had a little Bradford, like 100 microliters of Bradford in each of them. As the samples came off, we put in five microliters of the sample um, to get a sense of where the protein was coming off and where it wasn't. So we washed until the nothing was on nothing was coming out and then we started ramping up the imidazole and we kept that going and made sure nothing came out um it turned out it came out about like 30 millimolar imidazole to like 50 or so um so now we know and then we wanted to actually quantitate it um so we wanted to figure out how much protein was in there and so that's why we did that like standard curve at the top with bsa um, so like a known concentration, we did serial dilution, you add the Bradford, um, and then you do your unknowns and you add the Bradford. And so you can see which fractions our protein came out in, which massive fractions we were able to tell with our little PCR strip on the go. And then we put it in a plate reader, measure the absorbance. What happens is that the Bradford, it has these like different forms. And when it binds to protein, it stabilizes in this blue form, in the blue form, is blue and you can measure the wavelength at um, absorbance at 595 and get a sense of how much protein is in there and you can actually quantify it by going and comparing to the standard curve. Bradford is really great when you have imidazole in your solution because imidazole is not really great when you want to do like UV. Um, it absorbs at the same wavelength so like 280 as your protein does and so then you might trick the um, like your UV spec into thinking you have protein when really it's just imidazole and especially if you're doing a gradient you don't know exactly what the concentration of imidazole is in that sample right then um, then you can't really even background subtract and so that's why the Bradford comes in really handy um, you can't use just like the extinction coefficient and stuff for UV um, the UV stuff but once you dialyze the imidazole out, well then you can. And so speaking of that, we're in the process of dialysis. So in this here, we have dialysis. Basically we have this little pouch, this membrane pouch. The membrane pouch has a, um, it's a size, like it's got little pores in it. And the pores are the size uh, that is much smaller than our protein. So our protein is going to stay stuck inside of this little pouch but the small stuff can come out, including the imidazole. We want to get rid of that imidazole because we don't want it anymore. It can cause all sorts of problems down the line, so we want to remove that. In addition to removing that, we want to put some stuff in. We want to put in a little bit of glycerol so we can freeze this protein and it'll be happy. And we want to actually just like swap out the buffer. We have it in just like a tris buffer with imidazole and we're going to swap it out into a sodium phosphate buffer with a little bit of glycerol um, and um, yeah, not that imidazole. And so we're going to let it, we have this kind of like floating in a big, um, big beaker, beaker, that's the word, it's been a long day, a beaker of our buffer that we want to change the buffer into. 
and then we'll come in tomorrow and hopefully it'll be in the new buffer we'll do one more change out um to make sure that all of it's diffusing out and diffusing in um the bigger the volume you're diffusing and the more wash it, the more kind of swaps out you have the better chance you have for everything to diffuse in that you want to diffuse in and diffuse out that you want to diffuse out so anything small enough to go through the membrane is going to go in or out but your protein is going to stay put so you always want to choose a membrane that has a um, a cutoff of less than half of what your protein is. So if your protein is about 40, you want to have a cutoff that is below 20. And so this is like eight. Um, it's what we had and it shall work just fine. And so, yeah, so hopefully we'll come in tomorrow. Our protein will be still nice and soluble and happy. We'll be able to run a gel. We'll be able to um, do an enzyme activity assay, freeze this guy. Um, and so fingers crossed, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. It's always scary the first night when you're just like, Is there, don't, please don't crash, please don't crash, please don't crash. Um, but anyway, speaking of crashing, I am tired. Hopefully the bus will come soon and then I will be able to get some sleep. But huge congrats to Nicholas for his first protein purification and for doing a super duper awesome job. And I can't wait to see that gel and get some sleep. So yeah, oh, oh man, I just have so much grad school flashbacks. I haven't done protein purification in, I guess it's been a couple of months, but in grad school, I did it all the time. And so students got a real sense of what, what my life was like in grad school, except that then we were using a bunch of fancy machines and stuff. And here we're doing it more old school, which is fun. I did this in grad school too, though. But anyway, I'm like a protein purifier at heart. I love it. I love it. I love it. And it's even better when you get to do it with students and teach them and show them that for the first time and have them see that blue. Yeah.